Thank you. That was, who, who put that together? Is that Jim? Jim. Jim, thank you. That was beautiful. What a nice way to be welcomed. Hi, guys. Um, you can say hi, too, if you want. Hello. <laughs> Are you on? Are you She's on? the boss, if you haven't guessed, so. <laughs> I'm going to just grab my water right um, Thank you so much for having us and having us for a second time when we didn't come the first time. <laughs> Um, so thank you for receiving our team so beautifully the first time and it's such an honor and a privilege to be here with you. I am so impressed by Pastors Phil and Debbie and this whole church. I, you, you feel the presence of the Lord, Haley and the worship team, she's special. But I, and as I said, we travel. I just want to honor the way that you, you to know this is a special house of God and you've cultivated something beautiful. So thank you for inviting us to be a part of it. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't expected, but when we got to our room, we opened it up and there's just presents everywhere for our kids. And they were like, what? Is this Christmas? Like, what's going on? Um, and it just speaks to intentionality, the love of your house. And so yeah. just so thankful to be here. And um, like Bree said, we're pastors out in Redding, California at a church called Bethel. And uh, weren't always from California. If you're trying to wonder what her accent is, she's from England. I'm originally from Ohio. Uh, go Buckeyes. I don't think you're supposed to say that here. I know. It's a little tense. I know <laughs> the there's some rivalry, people across right? the, the border there. Uh, but uh, I grew up Southern Baptist. She grew up Baptist, so it could be a country song, a grid for the Holy Spirit. But just over a journey and similar story with you, we just had both had significant encounters with God and uh, brought us out to Redding, California. We did the ministry school there, and then she took one look at me and was hooked. We have different kind of versions of our love story, <laughs> like many of you who are married, and mine is accurate and his is embellished, but... <laughs> Just ask her if she didn't stalk me on Facebook or not. And see if that's... Stalk is a strong one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so we've been out in Reading for about 13, 14 years now and uh, have the privilege of being able to travel around. And um, it's just a real... Uh, honestly, pastors are our heroes. Uh, senior leaders are our heroes. We have the privilege of going to a place and giving our four or five best messages and then we leave. And uh, it's kind of like being grandparents, so I'm told, is you get all the, all the fun with the kiddos, and then the moment the poopy diaper comes, <laughs> mom and dad, you take care of it. <laughs> and so we just have great respect for them. And so we actually would love for Pastor Phil and Debbie to come up here. I'm going to invite the team to come up too, but we want to pray for these guys. Yeah, they don't team, know we're doing this. So. Our team, um, you've met most of them. You know them better than you know us, probably. Um, but this is Logan. You remember him? He's amazing. This is Daniel. <laughs> Sarah. Sarah, who you haven't met before. Sarah's from Seattle. She's a first grade teacher by trade, but right now she's uh, in her third year of the ministry school. So these four are all doing, they're in their third year of our school of ministry, and the third year is kind of like an internship program. So they get to hang with us for the year, and we get to hang with them, which is such a privilege. And then the amazing Sanjina, who's also from the UK, and, and Jamaica, who you remember, I'm sure, from last time as well. And then we have the wonderful Bianca with us, who you'll hear from a bit later too, who works with us, and so is incredible. Yeah. But Pastor Phil, Debbie, if you can come right up here, right up here, and you can fa face everybody awkwardly. You, you turn around and face. I want everybody to be looking at you, okay? And then team, gather around. Um, I want to, one, we're going we're gonna to pray over them, just bless over the team, actually has a word for them and a word for the church. Um, but I want to give you a homework assignment, okay? You're like, homework, what? Um, I would love it if you could go out of your way to find time this week to let these guys know how much they've impacted you or uh, something that you admire about them, respect about them. It could be a gift card. It could be a brand new car if you want. I won't limit your generosity. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, but on a, on a serious note, can you please just go out of your way? It could be a text message. It could be in person. It could be even a card or a letter. But just go out of your way to let them know uh, how much they mean to you and the impact you made. How many know that when you're in leadership, oftentimes, uh, you know, you're pouring out, you're encouraging people, but it doesn't always get poured back into you. It doesn't always flow back up to the top. And so I just want to give you assignment to, to target these guys, Point, paint a big bulldoze, uh, bulldozer, 
bullseye. <laughs> Not a bulldozer. Don't run them over. Uh, a big bullseye on them for this week. Sound good? But if you just want to stretch your hands towards these guys, we just want to pray over them and bless them, and then some of the team has a word for you guys. Yeah, thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling Debbie, Lord. Thank you for their hospitality, Jesus. Thank you for the way they love people, Lord. And for Phil, I felt uh, the, the Bible verse, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I felt the Lord highlighting uh, soaring for you. And I believe in this season you are going to have opportunities to travel. And I believe that doors will open for you to speak at other churches. So thank you, Jesus, for the favor over this man's life. I bless the way he builds leaders, Lord. And thank you for the loving, beautiful heart this man carries, Lord. Yes, and I just pray, thank you, God, so much for Debbie and just her heart for people. Debbie, I just see um, just so much love coming just from um, just who you are. And I feel like, um, especially with women, there's going to be women that just come here and they're going to feel so much love from you, Debbie, that they're not going to want to leave because they're going to feel so safe mm -hmm. and so cherished. And I feel like I even see you as an Esther where you just carry radical boldness, but also Aww. just this beautiful heart of love and I feel like um, just how Esther went before the king, like she was so bold, and yet she had so much favor even in the palace. And the, I mean, you know the story, but I just feel like um, you just carry radical boldness. And I see doors being opened for you, Debbie, to really just disciple women. But yeah, I just feel like the combination of the love and the boldness that you carry is so needed for such a time as this, just like Esther 414 says, such a time as this. And you're part of this, um, this movement of just empowering women and I just see you stepping into that with boldness and courage and I just bless you Debbie in your heart for everyone and I just felt um, for the church there was a few scriptures that were highlighted that kind of flowed into each other um, the first one was the scripture in Nehemiah where it says that everybody was building but they also had their sword in their hand and I feel like um you're in a new. You're going into a new season of building, um, and I feel like there is going to be. There's already unity in in the church, but I feel like the Lord's going to increase the unity that you have with everybody coming together to build and to also to 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 fight <laughs> when necessary. Um, and I felt like it was um, just a, a revelation, like of Jesus, even as He gave the revelation of who He was to the woman at the well, and the impact of that that it had on her whole village and I feel like the Lord saying that this house is a house upon a hill that can't be hidden and I feel like there's going to be such exponential growth that's going to be happening over the next five years and I feel like what you've cultivated here the Lord wants to actually spread and replicate so Lord we just thank you Father for this season of building Lord God we thank you Father for the unity that's in this church Lord God for the family Lord and we thank you Father for um, yeah each one being able to build and to fight at the same time Lord God I thank you Father that they fight for love, they fight for connection Lord God they fight for health Lord God they fight Heavenly Father to uh, stay connected so Father we just thank you God for those that will come into this house Lord God and have a revelation of Jesus that will literally change their lives Lord God that they will come into the fullness of who they are in you Lord God we thank you Father for um, just resurrection life Lord God flowing through the hands and feet Lord God of the uh, um, the, the this body, Lord God, and we thank you, Father, for um, yeah, just <laughs> even this house receiving a fresh revelation of Jesus, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name, Amen. Yeah, um, and and Jason, I as I was uh, praying for you, um, I just see that God is marking you. You are a forerunner for Christ, and I see there's a waves of revival coming to this church and to this uh, to Ashland. And I believe God is marking you to usher a move of God. And I see a new waves, floods of God's presence coming to this place. And I really believe that God is anointing you, is marking you with the fire of God, that you will lead movement, you lead people. I see the anointing of Moses over you. They're leading people to the promised land. Uh, Jason, 
you are chosen you are chosen you bring you are the fountain you carry the fountain of the living water and you carry the rivers of god within you and people are going to be drawn to you because you are uh, you carry him so well and jill i see that you bring growth to the people around you and to the community around you as you guys come together standing together that is a, a nurturing of a move of god that's going to bring growth that's going to bring an acceleration a quickening to this uh, church and to this community so i just bless you and i pray father mark them with the fire of god over their lives father in jesus name thank you god thank you come on and everybody said amen amen bless you guys thank you jesus jason just as you're heading back um as we were praying for you i just felt the lord wanted to honor your humility that you are an incredible man of god and you carry so much as as daniel prophesied the fire of god there's such a leadership anointing over you but i saw um the grace for you to put the right people in these roles and i saw you knowing when to step forward and when to step back and i felt the pleasure of god over you that you would like strength in the moment and then you'd empower at the right time and it takes great humility and i felt like the lord said just he wanted to say in front of the whole church yeah. you have a heart of gold yeah. Yeah. and you have followed his voice and what to do and and he wants to honor that you have an amazing heart thank you you guys are wonderful thank you thank you and uh, oh, go ahead do you have a word a little bit more of a word i have a little bit of a word too you, you go you go you go well, as as we were praying, I just I had a um, a picture of Jerusalem, and I was just thinking about the twelve tribes of Israel. And then uh, when uh, Sanjino was talking about Nehemiah, it, the script changed, and I feel like God is going to start giving you a strategy that, and it's not going to be limited to, but I feel like there's going to be twelve churches in the city that actually come together and start strategizing of how to strengthen the walls of Ashland. And I feel like God's going to start giving you blueprints to be a man of peace in the region. And it was kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like a coach, uh, you know, with a football team that uh, isn't tied to a particular system, but changes the system depending on the personnel that comes into their environment. And I saw you, uh, like, teaching other leaders in the city of how to morph and adapt depending on the times and the seasons and the expectations for the particular goal. I don't, I don't know if that's making sense, but I feel like that um, you're gonna see an influx of, re, of revival in people, but there, you're gonna see an influx of revival in actually the city. And I feel like you're gonna start seeing the economy really start to begin to be blessed here. And even in years to come, you're gonna notice where if the country goes in ups and downs, even economically, you're going to see a consistent uptrend in Ashland. And I feel like over the next 10 years, you're going to feel a continual uptrend. And I feel like families, not individuals, like families are actually going to be drawn un here, uh, unto here. And uh, I feel like a part of it is what Ruth said is you guys have done family so well that you've hosted family so well that I see more and more families coming to this area and being like, oh, Ashland's a safe place. Oh, Ashland's a great place for kids. Oh, Ashland's a great place to raise up in character uh, and, and love for the Lord. And so, Father, I just thank you for this church. Father, I thank you for the mandate just on the city. And, I, and, I, and this expansion of it's not just Kingsway Church, but it's like the 12 tribes and that each tribe has a, a role to play in the city. And I just saw a partnership coming together. And so we just bless that right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You guys are wonderful. So today we're going to talk about healing. I know. Some of you are like, that sounds fun. Some of you are like, I have wounds and hurt around healing. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about what the Bible says about healing. We're going to share a bunch of testimonies with you. And we're going to practice praying for one another, and we're going to see God move in power this morning. So I, I woke up this morning, I knew we were going to speak on healing, but I woke up with such a sense of expectancy of how God is going to move this morning. And I, 
I love to pray for people, but I also love even more to see the body of Christ um, be activated and equipped to do what Jesus has asked us to do. And I believe that praying for the sick is part of our mandate as believers. I I don't believe it's for uh, the one or two special people. I believe it's for everyone. In fact, Jesus, Jesus says, right, in John 14, 12, he says, anyone who has faith in me, who has faith in Jesus this morning? A good number of you. And we'll do an altar call at the end, make sure we're all in that. But anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. This is Jesus. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these. It doesn't say... The pastors will do what I've been doing. It doesn't say the one anointed man or woman of God. It says anyone who has faith in me. This is what Jesus is saying. And then he blows my mind. He says, and then they'll do even greater things than these. I believe this is a promise for us, but I I, I have this sense of expectancy that we're not just going to have a good meeting this morning, that the Lord's going to raise the watermark of what is possible for Kingsway Church and in Kentucky. I believe there's an equipping and an activation of something that's been inside of you for a long time. I believe the Lord is going to reverse disappointment around this subject. I believe people that have have been sick for a long time are going to experience the power of God this morning because that is who our Jesus is. Mark 16, verse 17 to 18, Jesus says, These signs will follow those who believe. Not those who know everything and have been through school. Not those who try really hard. Not those who have everything worked out in the theology. No, I'm, all of those are important. I'm not saying not important. I'm saying it says these signs will follow those who believe. believe. What if it's easier than we think it is? What if God is actually really good at his job? He calls himself Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. What if he's really good at his job and he needs a little bit less help than we think he does? What if our job is much more simple than we make it and our job is just to hang out with the one who knows how to heal? You see, I'm going to speak about healing this morning and Steve's going to speak about healing, but we don't know how to heal the sick. I know, bad news. <laughs> Flew us out here. Like, but you know what we do know? We know how to hang out with the one who does. And when we invite the presence of God in the room, when we are aware that he is with us, he is omnipresent, he is always with us, but when we're aware of him, when we're aware of the grace that's available, we access grace. Like Steve and I can be out on a date. (laughs) That's what we do when we're on dates, selfies. Um, We can be out on a date and I can be on my phone. I could be scrolling social media and not aware of the fact that he's right here with me. I would never let her do that. (laughs) Of course, never. It's just a possibility. Um, Pastor Phil spoke about this this morning, how often we're on our phone. What what is the point? God is wanting to speak to us all the time. It's just, are we tuning in? His grace is available. Like Steve is there with me. It's just, am I turning my affection and my attention to him? And see, Jesus says he's paid the price so that we can walk in healing and we can see people healed. Are we aware of the grace? See, if I know that there is really good chocolate in my fridge, I'm just going to break this down in a way we all understand. If I know there's a bar of Toblerone in there, I'm going to open that fridge and I'm going to eat it, especially if someone else has paid for it, right? This is, what, this is what healing is like. God's like, hey, it's in there. If you're aware that it's in there, you access it. Where you're aware of grace, you access grace. That's why you go to certain churches and the joy just breaks out every time God comes in the room. Why? They are aware that there is joy in the presence of God. They're aware that there is grace there and they access that grace. That's why you maybe come to Bethel and the presence of God shows up and people start getting healed. Why? Because we have a culture, we are aware of an aspect of the grace and goodness of God that when, when God shows up, we access that thing because we are aware of it. It's not, a, it's not a magic formula. It's just an awareness. What has he paid for? So today we're just going to talk about what has Jesus paid for? And as we do that, there's going to be a key to access that thing. Does that make sense? Um, we're passionate about this because it changed our lives. I, I'm not passionate about healing so I can have cool stories. I'm passionate about healing because I believe it displays the love of God to the world. I'm passionate about the gifts of the Spirit, not so I can feel good, or, but because I, I truly believe that God loves the person in front of me so much that he gave me tools to reveal that love. 
1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 are kind of our famous gifts chapters, right? If you read those chapters, it talks about the gift of healing and the gift of word of knowledge and the gift of prophecy. But what's right in the middle of 12 and 14? Love, right? 1 Corinthians 13, the famous love chapter. It's read at all the weddings. Why? Because the gifts are supposed to make a love sandwich. It's not so we can just see someone healed. It's because God radically loves them. See, I, I, for five and a half years, I was sick with a neurological condition called ME. And so I went from, I played a lot of tennis, did well in school. And age 15, I got diagnosed with this condition and went to being in constant pain. I could only walk a couple of steps. My legs would give way. I needed to use a wheelchair to leave the house. My mum and dad had to help me with things like cutting up my food, uh, getting me ready, washing my hair, just... I was very, very sick. I was light sensitive, noise sensitive. I spent months at a time in bed. And I grew up Baptist, like Steve said, Baptist in the UK. And I had never heard of God healing someone. I mean, I'd heard it, it was in the Bible. I just didn't know that it happened today. And I, I went to this church and they started talking about God healing people. And I got excited. I was like, I need that. I, I want to get my life back. My life was so limited. And um, I got prayed for for healing and nothing happened. And I was, as I said, I was 15 when I got sick and I, I got healed just before I turned 21. Um, but I started to make up my own kind of teenage theology about why I wasn't getting healed. I'm like, okay, if he still does that today, then why is it not happening? And so I kind of was like, okay, well, maybe if I pray better prayers, if I pray harder, if I pray the right words, then maybe God would heal me. Maybe I'm doing something wrong here. And you know, it's so important that we pray. But if our faith is in our ability to pray instead of his ability to answer, then our faith is misplaced. Right? So that, that, that didn't work when I tried to pray harder. And then I thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe I don't know my Bible enough. Maybe if I could read my Bible more, then maybe God would heal me. This is Ruth's teenage reasoning here. Again, it's so important that we read our Bible. But I don't read my Bible to qualify for God's blessings. I read my Bible to find out what blessings Jesus qualified me for. See, it's, not, I'm, it's the same behavior, but I'm looking at it to go, Jesus did it, and I get to access it. Jesus did it, it's a promise for me. Does that make sense? I'm not doing it to earn something. It, Jesus already earned it. I'm looking at the menu. Then I got to the point where I said, okay, God, here's the deal. If you heal me, I will share my testimony in front of hundreds and thousands of people and you will get all of the glory, which in my mind sounded really, really great, but I was, I was approaching God with a marketing plan, right? I'm like, like, you do this for me, I'll do this for you, I can make you look real good. And then God spoke to me, which surprised me because I didn't know that he still did that either. And he said, Ruth, I don't want to heal you because of anything you've done. He said, Ruth, I don't want to heal you because of anything you will do. He said, Ruth, I don't even want to heal you for a testimony. He said, my healing to you is a love gift. Honestly, this changed my mindset because I had gotten to the point where I stopped asking for healing prayer because I didn't want to make God mad. The idea that he wanted to heal me simply because he loved me was such a light bulb moment for me because I'd got into a works mentality. The truth is, we often turn things that the Bible calls gifts into rewards. Healing is not a reward. Healing is a gift. A gift by its very nature has been paid for by somebody else. If I get a gift and then I try and pay it, I change the nature. Or if I think the person giving it to me gives me a payment plan. They're no longer the good father giving me a gift. They're the boss that I have to please. See, how many of us take things that Jesus is like, hey, it's a gift, and we turn it into a reward, and we turn it from a father into a boss? See, there's no payment plan attached to this. This is a free gift that Jesus paid for. So I went to this conference, and this guy was speaking, and as he spoke, I had an encounter with God. And it surprised me because I'd never encountered God like this, but he reminded me of a moment when I was laying in bed. And I was crying because I was in so much pain and I was so frustrated about how limited my life was. And my dad was sitting on the edge of my bed and my dad was crying. And I remember my dad just saying, I just want my little girl back. 
And he said, if I could wave a magic wand and have your sickness myself, I would do that in a moment. And God reminded me of this time with my dad and he spoke to me and he said, Ruth, I am your dad and I want you to be well even more than your earthly dad does. And that is why Jesus did take your sickness and pay the price for it on the cross. It might sound so simple, but for someone that tried for so many years to earn something, it blew my mind that he would want me to be well just like my dad. In fact, even more so. The next day I went back to this conference and a lady called Heidi Baker was speaking and I didn't know what she was like, but it was different. But I was like, I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> she ended up giving me a hug and I felt more love than I'd ever felt in my whole life. And I remember as she held me, thinking, how can I film this much love from someone that doesn't even know me? And after she let me go, I said, please, can you pray for my Emmy? And she said, that's what I was praying for. She said, you need to go and buy yourself some running shoes. And she starts prophesying over my life. And she's like, your life will be marked by signs and wonders. You're going to see the dead raised, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. And God is setting you free. And I felt that sickness lift off of me. And I remember falling to the ground with such a sense of joy and relief. And then I stood up and I worshiped God without pain, without my legs giving way. You can be excited about this if you want. I'm excited still. I was, at, I was at university at the time. I had uh, carers to help take care of all my like, needs from cooking and laundry and all that stuff. I had people help take notes for me, get books out for me, just everything so that I could just dictate and lay in bed often. And at the end of that year, I got, to, I got completely healed. I drove back to my university campus. I screamed my head off. I called my mum and dad. He came to pick me up a week later. And I remember packing up my wheelchair with them, cleaning my room, watching them just weep over the summer as I played volleyball with my cousins and got to live a normal life. The very next day, I started seeing God do miracles. I went to my Anglican church in the, in the UK and I told my pastor what had happened. And he said, you should share with the church. This was brand new for them. I saw a little boy that had eczema get healed healed, another kid who had hurt his ankle get healed. And that set me on this trajectory of saying, this is a non-negotiable in the kingdom of God. See, this is not an additional extra why it changed my life. What if you're one step away? What if your faith is one step away from seeing somebody radically transformed forever? You see, somebody took a risk and it changed my life. And that's my Jesus. I believe we're supposed to be an army of believers that take a risk. And maybe we've taken it a thousand times, but it'll be worth it for the one whose life is forever changed because of the love of Jesus. That's my introduction to this morning. I preached a little longer. Sorry, babe. You know, I, I, I won't go into my uh, story too long, but I, I dislocated my shoulder 26 times playing sports, had surgery. Doctors tried to fix it. They couldn't fix it. I just became frustrated with my life. And it wasn't until I was in a meeting where a guy was speaking and in the middle of the message, he just stopped and he said, hey, there's someone here. You had a sports injury, dislocated your shoulder a bunch of times. Doctor tried to fix it. You're just frustrated with your life. If that's you, can you just stand up? And I was the only person to stand up at about 1,500 people. And Southern Baptist boy, remember. <laughs> so I stand up, nobody touched me, but all I can describe is I just felt like my body was on fire and my shoulder started physically moving on the inside. And uh, long story short, I ended up getting completely healed. I have an MRI to prove it. I have five years of playing rugby to prove it. Um, <laughs> my love language is physical contact, so. Um, but in one moment, everything changed. And like Ruth said, the reason why we're so passionate about the supernatural, it's not to have a good story. It's not to have people, oh, look at me, look what God did. It's not a, th like through me, but it's because it's a way for the, Jesus to display the love of God to the world. And for me, what I get excited about is I get excited about what if every single believer had the expectation that whenever they wake up and get out of bed, that nothing is impossible that no matter the situation, if they step in and if there's a problem, we actually have a solution. That we don't partner with what's happening, we actually get to usher in a, a different answer and a different solution. But you know, oftentimes, you know, uh, when, you, when you pursue God in that way, disappointment can come in because sometimes things don't happen the way that we were expecting them to happen. 
Anybody relate to that? You know, and for us, like we're not, we're not immune to disappointment, but the reality is, is disappointment is a thief and it's meant to rob your expectation of your faith for tomorrow. And it's so important that as believers, we don't, we don't run away from disappointment, but we actually run to Jesus through the disappointment. You know, it's though I may walk through the shadow of the valley of death. It doesn't say I go around it. A lot of people are trying to go around the valley when the answer is actually through it. It doesn't, it, 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 I, I don't, like, that's not to say circumstances aren't hard. Like, we, we've gone through a journey, you know, we're kind of known as the healing people, right? <laughs> but we went through a season in our own life uh, where, um, you know, the Lord spoke to us both and like, hey, I want you guys to start having a family, so we're like, I'm like, yes, I'm ready to try a lot. Um, <laughs> so many times as it takes, I'll persevere. <laughs> I'm joking, sorry. <laughs> so, I apologize. Sorry, I like to, I like to have her face turn red. <laughs> but anyway, so we, we find out a, a couple months after that that we're pregnant. And we're so excited and we end up going for our first scan and we get to the scan and the doctor does the, what's it called, sonogram? Ultrasound. And there's a, a baby there, but there's no heartbeat. Doctor's like, I'm so sorry, but there's, there's no heartbeat. And thankfully our doctor was a believer. And she's like, but um, she's like, hey, like, let's just take a week and let's just pray. And let's just believe for God to do a miracle. How many know it's pretty amazing when you can have a believer in healthcare? And what I get excited about is I, I'm not looking for people to become another preacher and a pastor. I'm like, that's amazing. If you're called, like, you just need to answer the call of whatever God's calling you to. But if he's calling you to the medical field, go to the medical field and infuse the kingdom in the medical community. What I love about this doctor is that they pray whether the patients know it or not for every patient that comes in. And they've even over time had to create a code for miracles because there's no code in the medical community for miracles for insurance companies because they've actually had uh, wombs created. They've had creative miracles, resurrection in the dead in the womb, all this amazing stuff. So we're praying for a week and we end up losing the baby. And that was hard. And so, you know, we, we move through that. We process the pain of that, process the disappointment, just bringing to God of like, hey, God, I don't understand, but I, I just trust you. I'm not going to change my theology based on my experience. I'm going to keep my theology based on your nature. And what we're in danger of is oftentimes is we can use our experience to dictate our theology. But the problem with that is, is if we allow our experience to dictate our theology, our experience will never rise above our current experience because our belief system limits us to actually experience those things. And so for me, I want scripture to dictate my belief system and allow my experience to come up to those things. But if my experience doesn't match the ultimate truth, it doesn't mean that I stopped believing it. It means I kept press pressing on to it. And so we go and we try again and we have another baby and we go in a little bit earlier and we get a scan and we get in there again and again, there's a baby, but there's no heartbeat. And in that moment, the doctor's like, hey, I, I want to let you know, like I have more faith this time than last time because we just had our first uh, resurrection from the dead in the womb just this past week where a baby was verified dead three different times on three different ultrasounds from three different places. And a week later they came back in and the doctor was doing the, uh, was discussing options of what, what's next. And while she's discussing options, she hears the Holy Spirit say, look again. And so she looks on the ultrasound and there's a perfectly formed baby. And so we are like, okay, let's take it. And so we go and we start praying and we end up losing the baby again. And come to find out that the baby that was resurrected from the dead was my niece. 
and my sister had this, uh, our due dates were one day apart. And, uh, and so my, I have a, we have a beautiful seven-year-old niece named Emma now that I'm just so thankful that God did a profound miracle. But how many know it's hard when God does a miracle for the person next to you that you're believing for? And the pain's real. Doesn't doesn't mean the pain's not there. Like, I still think about it, and I'm like, oh, man, I, I know I have my babies in heaven that I'm looking forward to meeting one day. But it doesn't change the reality that he's a good father, and he's a God of life, not a God of death. He's a God that gives abundant life. He's not a God that stills, kills, and destroys. He's a God that works all things together for good for those who love him. And so we just took a stand and like, okay, I'm not going to limit... Like, it, honestly, it robbed from us. It robbed from our expectation and praying for the sick where before it used to be fun because we're just hanging out with our dad and now it felt like a performance because we have this disappointment of like, oh God, yes, I'm going to believe a miracle for them, but we didn't get the miracle for us. But if we're not careful, what old, what, if we don't deal with the disappointment, it'll actually rob our expectation and our faith for tomorrow. And it's important we just hand over the questions of God. You know, in Philippians, uh, let's go there actually. Philippians 4 7. Sorry, my nose is a fountain. Oh, praise God. Philippians 4, 7 says, The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, if we want the peace that passes understanding, sometimes we have to give up our right to understand. And for us, it looked like handing over all the questions, all the why not God, what ifs, all those things over to God. And I still can't explain it, but a peace came that was so beautiful and then we ended up having, we got pregnant again, ended up having our baby girl, Hannah. Now she's six years old. She's back in there. But the first night that she was born, as soon as she took her first breath, all of a sudden the doctor started panicking and they ended up rushing her into the ER, into the NICU. And Ruth was still in the room and so I went back with her. And the doctors are talking. We don't know if she's going to make it. And so we have this, all, I, I'm just going to be honest, all I could think about was, no, God, not again. Not again. And I remember standing there, and she's crying, and they're hooking her up and poking her and all this stuff. And the doctor's like, hey, can you just come over and just put your hands on her feet? And so I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I went over, I put my hands on my, uh, her feet, and instantly she just stops crying. And there's just peace that comes in the room. And I can't explain it, but it was in that moment where I was like, okay, God, you got this. And then f- four days, f- five days into the NICU, where our daughter had two 24-7 carriers. She was hooked up to a breathing uh, machine where she was doing 700 breaths per uh, minute. Was, she was the sickest baby in the NICU. And there was even pre- preemies in there. And on the fifth night, we had a nurse from our church that was on duty that had my daughter. And for the whole night, she just held my daughter and just prayed in tongues the whole night, just worshiping and praying. And in the morning, we get a phone call, and they go, you need to come and see your little girl. Because we walked in, the doctor said, I don't know how to explain it but your daughter went from the sickest baby in the NICU to the healthiest baby overnight. The only way I can describe it is miraculous. Come on, Jesus. He said said miracle. Miracle. The only way, the words the doctor used, the only word that I have to describe this is a miracle. That came not because we prayed. Like, I believe my, my prayers are powerful and effective. And I believe that they played a part in it. But it happened because there was an ordinary believer at work that knew who their father was, knew that he gives good gifts to his kids and said, not on my watch. What would it look like if we had men and women in business, if we had people in healthcare, people in education, 
that when people come into my area of influence, they have no choice but to experience the kingdom. Um, actually going to pause here. We're going to, we're going to pray for a second, a second, but I, in worship, I felt like the Lord said he was wanting to unwind disappointment. Um, and so if you are in this room and you're like, when we talk about healing, I have disappointment around that area. Maybe it's someone you've prayed for. Uh, maybe it's someone you've prayed for and you've end up losing somebody. Maybe you haven't seen the breakthrough that you wanted to see. Maybe it's in your own life, some, something you've been believing for healing for personally. But if this kind of speaks to you around that disappointment, would you mind just standing up for me? Um, and I anticipate there'd be a lot of people. So don't, there's no, there's absolutely zero shame in this. Um, I think there's probably a lot more people in the room. But if you're like, I have some disappointment around healing, maybe just not the people you, the breakthrough you've seen. Um, thank you so much for standing up and being honest. Um, just going to give a second. If there's anyone else, just go ahead and, and stand up. I'd love to be able to pray for you. Honestly, there's zero shame in this. We do this at our church, which has a, a in our in our ministry school, and probably 95% of the room <laughs> stand up because we've had we've all had a journey, right? We've all had a journey. It doesn't mean we haven't seen breakthrough. It just means we have a journey. If anyone else wants to join in, jump jump on up. But um, and team, you can go around and pray. But here's what I'd love for you to do. I'd love for those of you standing, or and, and anyone else in the room, I'd love for you just to close your eyes for a second. Um, and I want you to picture a Jesus standing in front of you, and I want you to picture him holding a box. And I want you to put in the box all of the question marks, all of the, why did this not happen? Why have I not seen this yet? What, the, what about this word, God, that didn't happen? What, whatever it is, I want you to put in all the question marks, all the, the I haven't seen it things, all that you have, all the files. Put them all in that box. And then I want you to see Jesus take that box from you and I just see him putting it on a shelf. He does care about our questions. I believe there's a time when you'll revisit them all with him. And then I want you to say, Jesus, what do you have for me in return? And then we're not going to second guess this, but the first thing that comes into your mind. For me, when I did this, I saw a blue helmet and I felt like God said it was the helmet of peace. Like Steve uh, quoted that scripture, the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your heart and it will guard your mind. In Christ Jesus, I saw the Lord giving some of you a sword and saying the thing that was meant to take you out is the thing that you will actually fight with and is your destiny. I see Jesus breathing hope into some of your hearts, breathing hope into places that you almost feel um, dead or withered, that the Lord is like, I'm breathing my hope in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Some of you, I, I saw um, somebody getting a smiley face. I know that sounds odd, but I felt like the Lord saying, I'm restoring your joy. Um, and I saw the weight of grief being lifted off. And like Steve said, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and we aren't afraid to walk through grief. But sometimes there's moments where the Lord is saying, I felt like somebody is saying the time of grieving is over and the time of joy is here. And so, God, I thank you for that right now. I'm just going to pray for you. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are the God of hope. You are the God of hope. And God, I thank you that hope is not in a circumstance happening or not. Our hope is rooted in a person and his name is Jesus. God, I thank you that you are our hope, that Christ in us is the hope of glory. And God, right now, I pray that you'd speak and breathe a hope and expectation back into them and you would rewind and reverse every bit of disappointment in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you for anointing every person in this room to see miracles. God, I thank you for a courage coming on those sitting and those standing, that God, we would not be a people that back down, that no matter what we have faced, we would draw a line in the sand and we say, my Jesus says, my Bible says, I will walk in this in the name of Jesus. And so God, I thank you for your goodness. The last thing I want to pray is God, any areas of pain that feel so deep in this area, God, that we would come to you and we would give them to you. God, I thank you. You're not afraid of our pain. You're not afraid of our tears, but you meet us right there. The God who is acquainted with grief. 
Thank you, Jesus. Bless you guys. You can, you can take a seat. Um, we now have three beautiful little babies. We have four babies in heaven. We had two miscarriages after that as well. Um, so we've got seven little humans, four of them in heaven. But the Lord has been so kind. And the Lord has been so, so good to us, even in that journey. And it's been a journey to say, it's even a journey, as Steve mentioned, with his sister, a journey walking through a pregnancy where you're yearning for your own, a journey of celebrating the testimony and being in the place of longing. And I, I, I do want to share, like we're about to share a bunch of testimonies with you. And Revelation 19.10 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I want to encourage you that if you want to see more healing and breakthrough in your life, the number one way to do that is to feast on the testimony of Jesus. Because the testimony of Jesus prophesies what's available. You know, that story with his sister, I had a choice. Am I going to look at the testimony of Jesus as a reminder of what I don't have or a promise of what I will have? Come on. We can, the, 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 the testimony gives us a choice. And I'm saying, uh, that testimony, uh, it doesn't matter who saw it because it's the testimony of Jesus, right? Yeah, come on. Whether you prayed or someone else prayed or something you heard, you go, that's my Jesus and that same Jesus lives inside of me and he wants to get out. You see, God is not a respecter of persons. I'm going to give you a few key scriptures. Something that often is a hang-up around healing is, well, he did it for one. We, we just shared that testimony, right? He did it for Steve's sister. He didn't do it for us in that moment. And so often we can get in the mindset of, well, what if it's not his will to heal? Because clearly he did it there and not here. Anyone ever had that question? The, 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 the issue we have when we have that question is it's very hard to pray in faith for something you're not sure that he wants to do. Right? So I want to just quickly unpack that um, before we share a couple of testimonies and we jump into, into actually praying for one another. Jesus is perfect theology. So if we look at the life of Jesus, we see the nature of God, right? So Jesus healed all who came to him. Say all. all. No, no, let's, let's say it with a British accent. All. All. Oh, that's good. That's good. See, it's nice. Nice. Just a couple of little words. Jesus, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Your accents are cool too. Jesus healed all who came to him. You can look these up, but Matthew, a couple of examples, Matthew 12, 15, Matthew 9, 35, Luke 6, 19. It, it says it repeatedly, Jesus healed all who came to him. It also says Jesus healed every, say every. every. You say that right. Good job. I'm messing. You say all the words right. Jesus healed every disease and sickness, Matthew 4, 23, uh, Matthew 9, 35. And then it says Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Right? John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I love how it um, says in Hebrews 1.3, it says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus says, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. So it is only logical for us to conclude that if Jesus healed all who came to him and Jesus healed every disease and sickness and Jesus only did what he saw his father doing, he's the exact representation of his being and he says, if you've seen me, you've seen him. It is only logical for us to conclude that the will of the father is to heal every disease and sickness and heal all who come to him. Amen? Amen. Am I saying that every person I have prayed for has been healed? No. But it's what Steve said before. I am not going to allow my experience to dictate my theology because that becomes a very scary place for us. My theology needs to bring my experience up to, this is what scripture says. I'm just breaking that. This is what scripture says. If Jesus did healed all who came to him and healed every disease and sickness, then that has to be our expectation. You know, uh, it's Colossians 1.12. I've shared this with the men. Is It says that he has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. So if he qualified us to begin with, we have no right to disqualify ourselves because we never qualified ourselves to begin with. And so Ruth said it earlier, Romans 2.11, he's not a respecter of persons. It's the Psalms 23.1, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Many translations actually say the Lord is my shepherd, um, or it's, sorry, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Many translations say the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Ephesians 1.3, we've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, in him the fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form, which is Christ, and now you have been brought to fullness in him. 
it's important that we realize that we're actually not lacking anything. And just like Jesus healed all that came to him, he also said nothing will be impossible for those who believe, not try really hard. And so it's important that we actually understand this and that when things don't go our way, we don't try to explain it or try to figure it out. We actually just go, okay, God, I trust you. I don't understand this. I don't need to understand this, but I know that you're good. And I know that you're the healer. And I know that you are who you say you are. And I'm gonna keep pressing on until I see the kingdom of my gods become the kingdom of this world. Good. So we're going um, to we're going to pray for one another. And as Steve and I, we've been saying over and over again, we don't qualify ourselves for this, right? We, um, we have three small children. They have all seen breakthrough in healing. Our most recent is Olivia at 10 months old. She prayed for a lady with migraines. And she didn't say any words because she couldn't say any words. But she lay, laid hands on this girl who had chronic migraines and this person got completely healed. She sat next to, yeah, you can be excited about this. She sat next to a man who for 25 years had had severe pain from a diving accident. It actually had paralyzed him. Initially, he learned to walk again, but he was in severe pain. And he'd seen some breakthrough with our team and people praying over him. But then Olivia, our daughter, turned to him and blew a raspberry. The mics, it's a babe. <laughs> he gets completely healed. As soon as she does it, the pain leaves. I know, I don't understand it. Some of you are looking at me like, this makes no sense. What am I saying? Maybe it's easier than we think it is. Come on. See, I like to talk about healing as kind of like going to work with my dad day. My dad's this big deal architect, imagine. Um, this big deal architect, he's got all these plans out. I'm sitting on his lap in the big swivelly chair and I'm coloring in, feeling like a big deal, but what am I doing? I'm hanging out with my dad. See, we can't heal the sick, but we know how to hang out with the one who does. And because we hang out with the one who does, he gives us his delegated authority. He likes doing things with us. Come on. He likes to do things with us. We call, um, I'm going to tell you a couple more stories. We call our children at our church the big guns. We were like, okay, if people aren't seeing breakthrough, we're going to bring out the big guns. <laughs> Some of you are like, what does that mean? Jesus actually t t tells us to become like little children if we want to access the kingdom of God. And how many know children don't have a lot of stuff? Yeah. They don't, they, they aren't going well. What does this say? Do I have the right formulas? They, they just know I have relationship with a big God. What if we become like children who just have a relationship with a big God? You know, we had a man come out to visit our church who had stage four brain cancer. And he flew out. We have a healing rooms out there and he flew out to come to the healing rooms. Well, unfortunately, he came um, one of the two weeks a year where the healing rooms was closed. And he was pretty upset about it because he'd flown across the country. And so he comes, our healing rooms is on Saturday. He comes Sunday morning and he's pretty upset. And he's like, I need a man of God to pray for me. He's looking for Pastor Bill Johnson. He's looking for, you know someone to pray for him and they say oh we've got just the people and they lead him up to our kids church <laughs> and now this man's quite annoyed at this point he's like i have flown across the country your healing rooms was closed i didn't know about it i'm looking for pastor bill and now i'm surrounded by small children so the kids surround him and their teacher says okay kids ask holy spirit how you should pray for him i love that that's the, that's the relationship, right? There's no tools in this. There's no formula. It's relationship. Life with Jesus is relationship. So she says, ask how you should pray. And a little boy puts his hand up and says, Jesus says we're supposed to flick the cancer off. <laughs> okay, so angry man standing in the middle of small children who proceed to flick him. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, some of you are looking at me and I'm like, this is, I know this is outside of the box, but maybe God is outside of your box. Come on. Maybe he doesn't want to live in that box anymore. Okay, so they proceed to flick him. He, all of his symptoms leave in that moment. He goes home and he gets uh, scans and everything else. He is completely cancer free. Thank you, Jesus. You can be excited if you want. <laughs> Some of you are like, it can't be that easy. What if it is? What if Jesus really did pray the price 2,000 years ago? What if we've made this thing too complicated? What if out of compassion for people, we try and pray really hard when God just says, it's those who believe? <laughs> just flick it up. Just flick it up. <laughs> it's relationship. Uh, so some of us need to hear this because we've made this thing too complicated. Yeah. 
We have overcomplicated the something that God calls a gift, a free gift, and we've turned it into a reward that we have to work hard for and drum up and do all these things. And he's like, what if it's not your faith and it's his it's faith in him? What if it's faith in him? What if faith is a gift too? <laughs> so I'm hitting some things. Sorry, guys. It, uh, like uh, Romans ten seventeen, faith comes by hearing. Yes. So if we, if we want to believe mm-hmm. something different, we have to hear something different. Yeah. There's actually faith released in the word. And it, 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 we really need to get this. It's not in our ability to pray. It is in his ability to answer. We had a gentleman come up to me. He had uh, bone on bone. He had no cartilage in his knees. His knees were in excruciating pain. He's like, can you pray for me? I'm like, sure. I go to pray for him and he starts squinting and going like in a war path and praying in tongues, which is nothing wrong with that. But I wanted him to know that it's not based on his good behavior or his effort, but it's just based on his good nature and that it was a gift. So he's praying in tongues and I was like, whoa, whoa, time out. It's like, I just want to let you know, your job is just to rest and hang out. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to try really hard. You just get to be a kid and he's really good at his job. So I go pray again. He starts doing it again. So I'm like, okay, time out again. We do it a third time. He does it a third time. I'm like, okay, I don't think this brother's getting the message. <laughs> so I just strike up conversation. I'm like, hey, where are you from again? He starts talking to me. He's like, hey, I have an idea. How about you just repeat after me? Hold out your hands like you're about to receive a gift and repeat after me. Can you do that? He's like, yeah. And so I said, just say Jesus. And he said, Jesus. And then every English word in the dictionary left my mind except for one. And all I could think of was the word broccoli. I don't know how to describe it. And I'm like, I am not saying that. Like, I am not saying broccoli to this man. He's going to be so offended at me. And this is weird. Like, this is weird. But I couldn't think of anything. And it was just an awkward silent, you know. So now it looks like I'm incompetent. And he's coming to the minister for prayer, right? So I'm like, okay. So then I just say broccoli. And as soon as I say it, I don't know why, but as soon as I say it out of my mouth, I became weirdly confident. Like, I'm like, yeah. And he, he just goes, mm. and all of a sudden I'm like, say it, say broccoli. <laughs> and this guy just goes, broccoli. I'm like, go ahead and test out your knees. And just, he's not happy with me. And he comes down, goes all the way down, then comes up and goes, I go, what's going on? <laughs> it's like all the pain is completely gone. That's amazing. What's the point? The point is, it's not in my ability to pray. It's in his ability to answer that it's actually meant to be a relationship. That it's actually not, okay, I'm not just going to go into the mode and I'm just going to pray, but I'm going to go, Father, what are you doing? Because it's not what I'm doing. It's what are you doing? And then we partner with that. So good. So good. Um, I would love if you feel comfortable just to hold out your hands like you're going to receive a gift. There's nothing magical about this. Sometimes it just helps me remember my job is to be a really good receiver. I'm not trying to achieve. I'm receiving in the kingdom. So, Father, I thank you for every person in this room. God, I thank you for the gift of healing resting upon each of them. God, I thank you for the gift of faith being upon them. God, that what's inside of them would be activated right now in the name of Jesus. And, God, I pray that there would be a tangible evidence of the grace of God on their life, that they would lay their hands on the sick and they would recover in the name of Jesus.